A massive hood, a huge engine, a spacious cab, and a roomy sleeper, the classic American truck. In the late 1970s, Swedish manufacturer Volvo began producing trucks overseas, specifically for the North American market. A truck rolls off the assembly line every 10 minutes, a scale of manufacturing that calls for vast quantities of material. That's us moving a little over 850,000 different parts a day to the line to be consumed. Anything that holds up the assembly line threatens to delay production and must be avoided at all cost. The bunk manipulator has uh, broke down on them. The maintenance cannot get it fixed. We'll start installing bunks by hand. Customers have a choice of more than 500 different colors for the cab and the chassis. The truck is roadworthy just one day after it rolls off the production line, once it's passed all the tests on the in-house test track. It's a drive more new trucks in one day than most drivers will drive their entire life. Trucks are the most popular means of transporting goods in the U.S. 70% of cargo in North America is transported by road, a figure that continues to rise. More than 500,000 big rigs with that distinctive huge hood have left the Volvo factory since the late 1970s. Dublin, Virginia, home to the largest Volvo truck manufacturing facility in the world and one of the largest in the U.S. 3,500 employees build trucks here for the North American market. The flagship vehicle is the VNL. The long haul truck comes in several models. The smallest model has a relatively modest cab. The biggest is the sleeper, the VNL 860, which has space for two bunks. It has a width of over six and a half feet. The high roof model has an inside height of eight and a half feet. There's a choice of 11 liter, 13 liter, and 15 liter engines. Their power output ranges from 375 to 565 horsepower, depending on the application. The maximum speed is nearly 90 miles per hour. The skeleton of every model are these steel girders. Building the chassis takes a few hours. The workers start by securing the girders with over 400 bolts. More than 60 different bolts are used in the manufacturing process, and each has a specific function. The biggest is 13 centimeters long. The basic structures are assembled at a rate of one every two minutes. These are transported to the next workstation on a dolly. The track actually pulls these dollies along the way to each station in the plant for the operators to work on. The next station is where the truck's air suspension is installed. Three compressors power what's called the air ride chassis. The components that will be assembled over the next few hours have to be delivered at exactly the right time to exactly the right place. There's limited space in the factory, so many of the parts are only made available at the precise point that they're needed. Several hundred axles are delivered to the production line every day. Ensuring that assemblage runs smoothly is a massive logistical undertaking. Keeping the conveyor belt moving and preventing production from stalling means each component has to be in exactly the right place at exactly the right time. Up until this point, the chassis has been assembled upside down for the sake of convenience. Now weighing approximately two and a half tons, the truck is turned around. The next step is the installation of what's called the fifth wheel. That makes it sound superfluous, but in fact, it's a vitally important component. This is what we call a fifth wheel. It's not actually a wheel. But what it is, it's the locking mechanism for the pin on the trailer so uh, the truck can pull the trailer. Once in use, these trucks will be transporting tons of cargo every day. The 
The fifth wheel is attached to the chassis with 32 extra strong screws. The entire chassis is then painted with a clear lacquer, making it durable and resistant. Ten minutes later, the frame is dry. Meanwhile, the cab is being built in another part of the factory. First, the side parts are pre-assembled. Then they're transported to a robot that welds everything together. They're putting those two pieces together, so by the time it comes off the other end of this line, that sub-assembly is ready to be transported over to the main line where they're going to begin the process of putting the bulkhead and the floor pan together and then put the side panels in place. A bit like a house of cards, the side parts are now placed on the floor pan. One on the right side and one on the left. A worker fixes the sheets with a spot welder. Welding robots then take over to ensure they're 100% secure, welding over 100 spots in the space of four minutes. Once the roof is in place, the cabin is complete. This process is fully automated. Next, the cab is coated to prevent rust. Before the painting process can begin, the workers manually seal all corners and edges of the cab with silicone to prevent moisture from seeping in. Then robots apply primer. All the calves get the same gray primer, regardless what color will be applied later. The calves are then lined up at the factory paint kitchen. Customers can pick out a color from a palette of over 500 options. There are over 100 different shades of white alone. There is very little difference in the actual pigment of the color. Um, it's really what the customer wants. So some customers have a very specific color that identifies their brand identity that they market. So that's the color that we, we go with and that they pick. Um, but if you look at these two colors here, they're almost identical, but they are two different paint codes for two different customers. The paint doesn't come in a can, but directly from the paint kitchen in hoses several hundred meters long. Every four minutes, around seven liters of paint are pumped to the robots. Not a drop is wasted. That push the paint to the robot. And then from the robot, we flush it out through solvent, comes back up these lines, and the solvent pushes all the paint back to the kitchen and we'll reuse the, whatever paint we can reuse and we also reuse the solvent. The kitchen is where the paint is mixed. Because the whole room is full of highly flammable paints and thinners, it is specially protected against fire and explosion. Safety is the top priority. So electrical appliances are banned in the paint kitchen, including cell phones. Only explosion-proof phones are permitted. Once the paint has been delivered to the robots, it's atomized into a spray by a rotating nozzle. The paint particles are also given a positive electrostatic charge, and the cab a negative electrostatic charge. It's breaking up the paint particles and is spinning the paint particles onto the product itself. By doing so, you get better transfer efficiency. You get use less paint. It takes six to seven minutes to paint the cab, depending on the assemblage. Once dry, the color tone is inspected with a spectral measuring device. If the device finds an error, all responsible persons are automatically informed. It's red, 
it sends a red flag up to uh, our quality engineers, an email, text message sent to their phone. They'll immediately come down here and check and actually take the manual chip and manually chip it against it to make sure it's okay. Greensboro, North Carolina, home to the company's technical center and top secret development department. Visitors aren't allowed here and cameras are strictly forbidden. Jason Spence is product strategy director for North America at Volvo Trucks. Driver safety was one of his primary considerations in the planning of the newest model. After running numerous crash tests, he and his colleagues came up with a design that ensures maximum protection for the truckers in the event of an accident. You're the first on the scene, for example, when you hit something, you're right over top of it. In a truck like this, you have a lot of mass in front of you to absorb energy before the driver is impacted. But it takes more than safe cabins and excellent crash test results to sell a truck. Customers want more. They want comfort. The integrated king-size bed with adjustable headrest is a major selling point. When I'm parked on an incline, a surface that's not level, you know, when you're sleeping and your feet are above your head, you wake up with my headache. Well, if they're able to incline their bunk slightly, they don't have to worry about where they're parking their truck. Things like this, were, you know, really, we, we realize this is a home run. Nowadays, Volvo is one of the largest truck manufacturers in the U.S. The VNL 860 is a top seller. It has a high roof and an interior height of eight and a half feet. The sleeper is over six and a half feet wide and six and a half feet long. Standard equipment includes a microwave, refrigerator, and TV. You can see how large I am and how much space I have in this bed. There's so much. We even have our sleeper control panels. I can control the air conditioning back here. I can turn the lights on and off my temperature. I also have a refrigerator over here. And we actually have another bed up here. I'll bring it on down. And we even have a ladder that we can bring down to get into that bed. We have lights up here as well. We even have charger ports up here. We have our airline style uh, shade, so it's easy to block out the sun if you want to sleep. You got a television, you have a microwave uh, for when you're resting, if you want to cook food on the go. The truck is designed to accommodate two drivers. Because truck routes in the U.S. are so long, a vehicle is often shared, and both truckers need their own space. The front of the truck is very different from a passenger car. If I stand up, you'll notice the chair will, will adjust. It's going to, to drop back down. See the auto adjust. Now when I sit back down, give it a minute, it starts to adjust and it, based on my, my weight, kind of gives me the height it thinks I'm going to want. Instead of gear sticks, more than 90% of vehicles are equipped with a 12-speed automatic transmission, complete with performance and economy buttons. But American Trucker's most popular accessory is probably the giant drink holder. Up to three one and a half liter cups can be stowed here, enough coffee to make sure no trucker nods off. So we try to make everything as easy as possible for the driver, including a comfortable ride. You can put the steering wheel exactly in the position you want. Two types of motion, in and out and up and down. And if I push this halfway down, I will get the neck tilt. Hagerstown, Maryland. This is where the engines are manufactured. One unit weighs almost 2,500 pounds, approximately the weight of an average passenger car. The engines are traditionally painted green. Production begins with the delivery of the engine blocks from Sweden. The majority of the vehicles are fitted with a 13-liter diesel engine. We go by liters for all of our engines. So all of our cars, everything, it's measured in liters, yes. The 13-liter engine is a six-cylinder diesel unit and produces between 420 and 540 horsepower, depending on the configuration. 
An empty engine block alone weighs over 200 pounds. Firstly, the block is given a number. Then it begins its journey along the factory's assembly line. The cylinders are installed by robots. Meanwhile, two different machines sand and drill the crankshafts. We have two drills. It's all based on cycle time. The cycle time is much longer to drill through the part than it is to mill the part. We can mill the part in four minutes. It takes us 10 minutes to drill it. The crankshaft is the heart of the engine. It's refined with an induction hardening machine from Germany that rapidly heats it to 1,200 degrees and then quenches it with cold water. This makes the surface even harder and more resistant. This is the result. The crankshaft will convert the movement of the pistons into rotational motion with the help of so-called connecting rods thereby making the wheels turn. It's installed in the engine block. The next components to be put in place are the valves. These are oiled manually before being inserted. Four per cylinder, a total of 24. The cylinder head is put in position with the help of a crane. The engine block is now complete. It's transported to the next station by what's called an AGV, an automated guided vehicle, which is basically a self-propelled robot. It stops at every workstation in the factory, waiting in place until the parts have been assembled before moving on. There's a guide wire in the floor. The guide wire is a way to communicate with the AGV. There's a sensor in the bottom of the AGV, and it holds the wire, and it follows it the whole way around. The only time the AGV stops is if you're in front of it, there's a safety laser that will, will stop automatically, or there's things in the ground called RFID tag, where the engine stops for each station so we can do the appropriate work onto it. When it's made, it, it can manipulate, every station you're gonna see is moving and turning, and that's again, a, that's for position for the operators to be able to build appropriately at each station. In about three hours time, the engine will be started for the first time. But before that, Another 400 fixtures need to be mounted with the use of special tools, such as this electric ring spanner, which opens with the push of a button. In the past, the fuel line fittings had to be tightened by hand. The electric tool saves 70 seconds per fitting. The bolt is secured with one push of the button, and a second push releases the grip. You can't get a normal gun on this because there's a line going in there. So when he tightens it, so as you can see, I can't get it out because that gap, as you can see there, see the gap is over here, I can't pull the line out. So this gun is used, it has a dual trigger, so go ahead, Barry. So he hits it again, I can pull it in and out. There's a specific torque for each screw on the motor. That's why employees use digital torque wrenches. These record exactly which screw on which motor has been tightened when and how tightly. All this information is sent to the central computer via Wi-Fi. The bolts and nuts are first tightened by the workers with a conventional fast-turning cordless screwdriver and then with a torque wrench. The AGV only moves on once the green light's been given. If a part is missing, the engine remains at the station. This six-fold torque wrench is used for the crankshaft damper. It tightens the six screws with the correct torque in the correct order. This ensures that the damper lies completely flat against the engine block. In the 13 liter crank damper, we have six fasteners. It's a two stage torque, so rather than doing 12 hits with a handheld torque gun, you do two, two cycles with this multi spindle torque gun. In the next step, 
The engine is fitted with four oil filters, three large ones and one smaller one. The engine will have capacity for up to 36 liters of oil. The oil only needs to be replaced every 54,000 miles. The job of the filters is to keep the engines lubricated. To do this, they filter out any burnt oil particles, along with dirt and dust from metal abrasions. Then comes the inspection. At seven separate stations, workers check by hand whether all the parts have been correctly installed. The engines are about to be started. The yellow AGV's work is done. From now on, the units will be transported on a conveyor belt. The engines now enter the factory's test area. Before testing begins, the engines are filled up with oil and other liquids. While we're filling it, we're rotating the crank. It rotates at about three RPMs, but while we're filling it, it's rotating and pushing the oil into the cavities where we need it. Filling up takes 60 seconds. The first test can begin. A worker attaches pipes, cables, sensors, and exhaust pipes to the brand new diesel. This is done on a turntable. While that's happening, another engine on the other side of the turntable is tested in parallel. Then the positions are switched. The engine that's been tested is moved along, replaced by the next one on the test stand. This job. I wouldn't want to do nothing else, I don't think. It's, it's, it keeps you busy, but it just, it's just neat to do it. And it's a challenge every day to try to stay on the same pace. I really enjoy it. Each new engine runs on the test stand for four minutes. There's no time for it to warm up, which is why this is called the cold test. During every shift, at least one engine is randomly selected and taken off the assembly line. This engine is put through a hot test, tested for 22 minutes at every RPM range. If everything's working, the next stop is the paint kitchen. All the engines are painted green. Any parts that shouldn't be painted are taped up. Robots spray the engines in two paint booths. A lot of rust preventative as well that, that goes along with it. And also on the customer side of it, um, they do really like seeing that green engine whenever they open up the hood. Once the paint is dry, workers remove the protective covers. Now the 13-liter V6 series six-cylinder diesel engine is ready for transport to New River Valley. It weighs more than a ton. Depending on which production week it's earmarked for, it will now either be stored for a few days in the warehouse or go directly to the shipping dock where it will be loaded onto a trailer. Monday morning. The early shift at the New River Valley plant is getting started. More than 300 truckloads of parts have to be unloaded per day. This is done at approximately 120 loading ramps around the plant. Only parts that are being stored temporarily are sent to the high bay warehouse. All other loads, such as the tires, are installed immediately, including the engines from Hagerstown. Forklift trucks take them directly from the loading ramp to the assembly station. I have operators unloading wheels and tires, engines and transmissions on both sides, and then staging them in order, sequence for the line. You pick up the next one, that's the next truck that's going down the line. They're sequenced from Hagerstown, then we sequence them right here on the dock to go to the line. Meanwhile, small parts are delivered in standardized wooden crates and brought to the high bay warehouse. The plant requires about 750,000 cable ties every day, so they're stored here in bulk. Logistics specialists distribute them in small quantities to the respective assembly stations. 
The high bay warehouse consists of nine five-story shelf units. Seven of them are loaded and unloaded by robots, two by humans. A team of 20 warehouse workers constantly checks which part is where, where it needs to go, and how long it will take to reach its destination. Then it generates what we call uh, a ticket. This is a receiving tag. Um, a zip tag is what we call them internally. This tells us parts are received now with the quantity and where it's going, 58. So they'll take it and place it on the conveyor. When it goes through, that, there's a curtain on the uh, conveyor. That reader will read our zip tag and it'll tell it where to take it in an open cell down here. This basically has 10,142 cells in it. So there's no way somebody can memorize where every package is in there. Each loading and unloading procedure is recorded in the main computer. Two human-operated cranes are responsible mainly for bulky goods, larger crates that can't be loaded by the robot cranes. The crane operator transports the wares from the ground to a free cell, unloads them, scans and saves a ticket and the location, then returns to the warehouse for another crate and starts the procedure all over again. When material is needed in production, the high bay warehouse automatically sends it via this conveyor belt. More than 1,400 of these crates leave here per shift. They contain everything from radios to window regulator motors to headlights. The warehouse is restocked at the same rate as it's emptied so that the shelves are always full. We have five haulers per shift that do nothing but pick parts off of the end of this conveyor and they take it to the use point where the part's consumed on the line. There is just over 15,000 different part numbers that go onto the truck. That's us moving a little over 850,000 different parts a day to the line to be consumed. Still, there's always a screw or something or other missing here and there. That's where the so-called hot part runners come in, like Mike. He fields emergency calls from the various stations and then fetches the missing parts. Every part, however tiny, is crucial to the production process. They would miss and that would shut the line down and prevent the trucks from continuing to be built. Mike has to know exactly where each part is stored. He often has just minutes to locate it before production runs into a serious problem. This is where the dashboards are fitted. The mobile lifting platform means women can also work at the station. Women make up close to 25% of the factory workforce. Some jobs, however, are done exclusively by men, such as installing the windscreens. First, rubber is stretched across the windscreen and wiped down with lubricant. Then a string is inserted into the rubber. While the cord is pulled out from the inside, a technician fits the screen into the rubber. It's wiped down and the job is done. The next step is to fit the seats. It's vital that each seat is fitted into the right place. There are 24 possible variations. Like the engines, the seats are positioned on the conveyor belt in the order they're needed. The door panels, loudspeakers, side windows, and window regulators come next. The cabin moves along the main assembly line at a speed of three and a half feet per minute. It passes through 56 different workstations as it's assembled piece by piece, including the steering wheel and storage compartments. The workers install a total of 750 to 900 parts in the cab. The large refrigerator is a particular highlight. This is a refrigerator installed in the unit. You can see it got a lot of storage space inside the unit for the driver. It's really, really good on over drivers that take a long over the road trips. 
In the meantime, the power supply has also been installed. An employee now checks every single switch. Everything works perfectly. But a stressful situation is brewing at the next station where the bunks are being fitted. The crane is defective. The bunks have to go in the trucks. But the robot is on strike and can only be serviced when all circuits have been switched off. Minutes pass. The men look for a solution. A bunk weighs 130 pounds, and there aren't enough workers at the station to assemble it by hand. The bunk manipulator has uh, broke down on them, and they're waiting on maintenance to fix it. Uh, so they're either going to try to get, that, get it fixed. If maintenance cannot get it fixed, we'll start installing bunks by hand. We'll just bring extra operator in to help put those bunks in by hand. It's hard work, but they get the job done. Still, it's only a temporary solution, and the technician still can't get the crane to work. Finally, the error has been found, a bent safety bar. Now the team can get back to business as usual. The crane lifts the bunk into the perfect position where it can be secured. More than 160 forklifts and transport vehicles are in operation every day at the factory. Stop signs that are operated manually ensure that people can move around the plant safely. We have a lot of vehicular activity inside the plant. We have virtual stop signs where if there's going to be a cross point between the lines, you literally hit a button and a virtual stop sign comes on. It stays on for 30 seconds to give time for the engine or transmission to cross over to this point. The engines from the Hagerstown plant are now transported to the assembly line along the roof by wire rope hoists. Each engine is reserved for a specific truck. The chassis is put in position. Then the workers carefully insert the 13-liter engine unit. Once it's installed, a huge coolant radiator is put in place. Forklift trucks transport four tires simultaneously from the delivery docks to the assembly line. The employees then assemble them with the aid of small lifting cranes. Four tires per axle are fitted to the rear axles. In this way, the truck can distribute the weight of the trailer over several tires. The wheel nuts are fastened with a cordless screwdriver. When they install the tires, that they literally are using an air assist electric torque gun. So they're functionally tightened down five nuts at a time, which again is designed to make sure we have the right quality verifications in place for that unit before it goes to the next station. Now the cabin also leaves the ground and continues its journey through the air. Before it's placed on the chassis, the workers install the air suspension. This provides additional suspension for the cab. The chassis is now prepared for the so-called wedding. This is what the men in the factory call the process of joining the chassis and the cab. It takes just a few minutes to transform the two main components into an actual truck. This chassis that's behind us three hours ago was just two steel frames being put together. Between there and then, people have dressed the chassis, put the axles on, put the tires and engine on, and now it's preparing to have its cab deck. The aluminum tanks still have to be fitted. They weigh only a few kilograms and can easily be mounted by hand. Depending on the configuration, the tanks have a capacity for up to 300 gallons of diesel. The cab is on its way. The magic moment is approaching. The workers carefully lower the cab and attach it to the chassis. All plugs and connections have to be connected. The crane releases the cab and heads back to pick up the next one. 
Every four minutes, a new cab is set down and installed. Every four minutes, a new truck is completed. Then comes the hood, the truck's defining feature. American trucks are famous for their distinctive engine hoods. European trucks don't have one. There are several reasons for this. On the one hand, it's a matter of tradition. But in Europe, there's also a maximum truck length. In the US, that classic American adage still applies. The bigger, the better. Before the hood is closed, the workers always knock on it four times. Here's why. They knock four times on the hood because they want to make sure there's not anybody inside the hood working. It gives their colleagues a notice that they're getting ready to close the hood. Once the radiator grill is in place, the truck is complete. The final step involves playing the latest software version on the system, and the vehicle is ready to go. Now it heads to a technical inspection. The trucks are lined up in three lanes. Eight drivers get them ready for a lap on the in-house test track. 44-year-old Mike Maloney is one of the test drivers. He was a trucker for over two decades. He began working here four years ago and now tests between 15 and 18 trucks a day. He vouches for their quality with his signature. I have a sticker for proof of my being the one driving it. Uh, then we, uh, I'll look over the pink sheet to make sure that we're all good to drive and what's been wrong with it. And you see, ABS has been signed off, so it's good to drive. And then we just uh, walk around and make sure our, all of our bolts have been marked so they've been secured so they're tight. Just make sure the whole truck's just safe. I, I look at that truck like I own that truck, and I know what the man wants when he buys it. I, to make sure that it's perfect for him, as perfect as we can get it. Mike checks the mounted components first. Everything has to open and close perfectly. Everything has to have the proper clearance. And nothing can be loose. Each truck has to pass the visual inspection before it can be driven. When we climb in, we'll have to finish up the yellow worksheet for when we go to the track. In the interior, Mike tests that everything works as it should. Every button, every switch, every indicator light. He has to fill out an official worksheet. The test track is part of the factory premises. Another test driver is already doing laps. Yes. He's known as ZZ Top yes. because of his beard. Gasoline. His driving technique is legendary. Gasoline. No one can complete the circuit faster than he can. Gasoline. There's a strict speed limit on North American highways. Gasoline. Mike drives over that limit pretty often. Gasoline. I get to drive more new trucks in one day than most drivers will drive their entire life. I want to get it up to a certain speed. Right now I will check and make sure there is no vibrations. I want to make sure that the engine brake is going to work, which you can feel that. When I'm in, in a turn, I want to make sure that the rollover valve is going to work and it will shut the engine down if I get in too much of a rollover. A test drive comprises four laps, covering about six miles. When it passes, the truck gets its stamp of approval and is ready to hit the highway and head to its buyer. Several hundred trucks are dispatched from the factory every day.
In Europe, long-haul trucks are often shipped or transported on trailers. But because the distances in the U.S. are so huge, the manufacturers come up with a different system. One truck tows up to three others and drops them off at the customers. The workers mount an orange-colored coupling onto the trailer coupling, the so-called fifth wheel, and attach a truck to it. The towed truck reverses and gets a few simple taillights that are easily connected by cable. What at first glance looks rather provisional is extremely effective and saves costs. After delivery of the last truck, the driver doesn't have to drive back to the factory in a truck with an empty trailer. Well, as you can see, the trucks are stacked, and then after they deliver the last tractor, which is the one that's hauled the others, then that driver is going to get an airplane, fly back to the New River Valley, and then be assigned the next truck so he, be, he will be delivering somewhere. A maximum of four tractors can be connected to one another anymore, and the convoy wouldn't manage to get around bends in the road. Every day, 14 drivers pack their bags, get behind the wheel, and head out to the customers. These three new tractors will be in Canada tomorrow. Our trucks actually are built for the North American market, which is Canada, the United States, and Mexico. So these drivers that leave here functionally can be driving 3,000 miles away, or maybe they're driving 150 miles away. From above, the plant's welcome center looks like a gigantic company logo. A very special guest is visiting today. Chuck Wilson and his wife might look like average tourists, but Chuck is probably the plant's most famous customer. In the past 35 years, he's probably bought more trucks here than any other customer. When we sold the company, we had about 750. Uh, so through the years, with all of the turnover, it's, it's several thousand. <laughs> Around 6,000 trucks in the company's trademark colors, green and red, have been delivered to Wilson Trucking since 1982. Almost every factory worker in New River Valley has worked on a truck for Chuck Wilson. Today, Chuck's very first truck is on display in the Welcome Center, a green F7 built in 1982. That was my last deal with the Wilson Trucking. Yeah, yeah. Instead of them buying a truck, I bought a truck for a dollar. It's also the first Volvo truck manufactured in the U.S. Chuck sold it back to the company for a token one dollar. First U.S. production Volvo, Wilson Trucking Corporation, September 1982. But yeah, it's, you can see how the, the how this kept was kept up. This is the original. A few years ago, we were trying to restore the truck some. We repainted the frame and, and so forth, but it's in very good condition. <laughs> From the past to the future, this is Vera, an autonomous driverless tractor. The manufacturer's engineers are already testing the first prototypes. The concept is radical. There's no driver's cab, the engine is fully electric, cameras and sensors are installed around the tractor. Vera is wirelessly connected to a control center, which monitors location, battery charge, and other parameters. The vehicle is intended for use in enclosed areas such as ports and logistics centers.
But plenty more trucks will be made at the plant in Virginia before Vera conquers the highways. The long distances that need to be covered have prompted many truckers in the U.S. to give up their homes and actually live in their vehicles all year round. Like Ken and Beth Zelton, their truck is well known across the country. It's been dubbed Kermit for obvious reasons. The couple love long journeys, and that makes them popular with haulage companies with far-flung customers. In addition to the double bed at the rear, the apartment has a microwave and two refrigerators. And behind the passenger seat, there's even room for Stacy the dog. The couple has lived on the road for the past six years. I'm proud when I drive in someplace, Security looks at that name and he says, are you Ken? And I can say, yes, I am Ken. This is Kermit. John and Miriam Brown own what's probably the biggest truck on North American roads. They have invested a lot of time and money in their custom-made truck. It's basically a motorhome with a trailer. We wanted to travel. We wanted to spend uh, all of our time together. Yep. And it definitely fits the, the bill for both of those. We had planned to do it for a year. Here we are 14 years later. As far as I know, we're the only VNL style Volvo in North America that runs the 20,000 pound steer axle in the 425 steer tires. You'll notice we've got the, the RGN ramps for a removable gooseneck trailer. As you can see, the back's all been customized. And there's our ladder to gain access to the top where we keep our surfboards and things. A two-room home with 500 horsepower. All right, here we are inside. Big screen TV that comes out on an arm to view anywhere you'd like. Our couch folds down into an extra bed. This is the dinette. It's on a slide out, so when it's open, we have a lot more living space in here. And Mazzy has her little bed under there with all of her toys. <laughs> Down here, one of my very favorite features of the truck is our all-in-one washer and dryer. Coming into the kitchen, I've got my double sinks and my two burner electric cooktop, which is awesome. After our first year in trucking, we realized that if we were going to stay in it, we needed to find a way to be more active and make better eating choices. Yeah, and, and we uh, wanted to stay in it. We love trucking. And we love trucking, yeah. so this was the only way to do it for us. Every year we say, well, we still like it. It's still a good good way to yeah. live a life, so. We make a good team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. A massive hood, a huge engine, a spacious cab, and a roomy sleeper. The classic American truck. 3,500 people work in the huge factory in New River Valley, Virginia. A new truck rolls off the assembly line every five to 10 minutes. More than 300 trucks deliver materials and components every day. Demand is huge. 750,000 cable ties alone are used on a daily basis. Customers have a choice of more than 500 different colors for the cab and the chassis. It takes just 12 hours to build a new truck with some 2,800 individual parts. The final inspection takes place on the in-house test track. Every truck has to pass the endurance test over four rounds before delivery. In the past few decades, more than 500,000 trucks have left the factory in Virginia and thundered along the highways of Canada, Mexico, and the United States. Extra, extra large trucks made in the USA.